On this episode of Urban U, we celebrate Pride Month with stories that explore the LGBTQ experience, past and present. We feature one of the most important figures of the civil rights and women's rights movements of the 20th century, Pauli Murray, and offer you a sneak peek into a short film about being a queer Chinese dance artist. We also talk theater, video games, and dolphins right here in the East River. Welcome to Urban U. It was a warm spring day when one lucky New Yorker captured this video of some unexpected visitors cruising along the East River. Since we couldn't talk to the dolphins, instead we spoke to Dr. Diana Reese, the director of the Animal Behavior and Conservation Graduate Programs at Hunter College. She's also a world-renowned expert in dolphin behavior and cognition. It's Dolphins and Diana Reese in this edition of CUNY Conversations. Great. So, Diana, thanks for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, I guess you got to see the dolphin video. And since, you know, many people look at dolphins, but you're the expert. When you look at that video, what is it that you see? Well, I was pretty excited when I saw the video. And uh, I saw three common dolphins. And uh, these are actually called short-beaked common dolphins. And they look fine to me. Sure, and could you tell anything behavior-wise or body language-wise from the way they were swimming or behaving with each other? Yeah, well, normally we'll see dolphins in groups or what we call affiliations. And these, are th these were three dolphins. Uh, they looked healthy just in terms of the, the short bits of video I saw. Um, they didn't seem stressed at all. And it looked like they were out there exploring the waters off of uh, New York. So... The thing that I find so interesting about your perspective on these animals, Diana, is that so often when we talk about dolphins and whales, I end up talking to a biologist, but you study dolphin psychology. So how is your approach different than, you know, what a, a biologist approach might be? Well, there's a lot of overlap. I mean, I'm a marine mammal scientist, so we share that in common. But I try to understand the nature of their intelligence, the dolphin's intelligence. So we do field work as well as working in aquaria where we can study them up close and personally, they get very different, very different reports. And so, you know, when I Googled and when I YouTubed, there were other videos of dolphins that have come up the East River and into our waters. And it kind of comes back to that silly question everyone asks at the beach, like, are there really fish out there? And it seems that the answer to that is yes. And these large marine mammals don't seem to be so uncommon to our waters. Not at all. In fact, um, these, this particular species, the common, it's a short beak common dolphin, they live off the East Coast. And normally during the winter months, they're found uh, just north of North Carolina, north of Cape Hatteras, um, up to around Delaware. So these are our neighbors, you know, our southern neighbors. And then over the summer months, they start, they seem to also start moving up the coast. Uh, more into these waters and go up into more Canadian waters as well. So it's not unusual and they've been sighted other years as have many other species of dolphins. You've, you've been doing this for, for so long and you're such an expert in your field. Um, in the areas around New York City, are we seeing more of these animals in your opinion? Well, it's an interesting question. It's a little hard to answer because historically there have been reported sightings of these animals. In terms of um, whale watching boats and people reporting, now people have more cell phones. So often we'll get shots of, you know, the people have taken. It's like citizen science, which is terrific. But the effort of whale watching has increased. So, for example, the boat that some of my students have been going out on is called Gotham Whale. It's the princess uh, boat line. And that effort, the amount of time they're spending on the water, watching for whales, documenting them, has increased because we want to be able to protect these animals in our waters. The more we know about them, the more we can protect them. Well, Diana, I could talk to you about dolphins all day, but unfortunately, we don't have all day. But thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. And uh, I hope we get to do it again soon. Absolutely. It was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Take care. Take care.
Keep Wonderful. watching whales and dolphins. Yep. When I first started Girl Vows and Organization, well, I really wanted to start the organization at the age of 16. Um, and that was the, during the time that I was going through my turmoil and people came to, to rescue me, so to speak. Um, and I said, you know what, I'm gonna, one day I'm gonna do something for girls that were like me. Since 2015, Dawn Rowe, a three-time CUNY graduate, has been impacting the lives of young women through Girl Vow, a gender-focused mentoring program for girls and LGBTQ youth who face poverty foster care, and the juvenile justice system. Can you talk a little bit about some of the things that these young women are experiencing in their lives? I have young people who are experiencing sex trafficking, what we call them sex survivors. Um, I had a young girl who was recently shot by her pimp. Um, I've had young girls that have babies from relationships where they needed a place to stay. A man would say, well, I'll give you a place to stay. And it turns into a relationship. And she winds up having a, a child from this man that she never wanted. A lot of the stories are really horrific. And some of the experiences that the young people have, like you would never think in a million years that young people were suffering to the point in which they are. I was in and out of incarceration since I was like 15. My name is Kaleja Thompson, and um, I'm affiliated with Girl Vow by being a part of the youth. My grandmother had passed away, so I didn't really have a person to like help with my daily needs, like keeping money in my pocket and stuff like that. So I started to like steal from other people. So I was in Rikers Island three months, and then I came home. I did the same thing. I got locked up again. I did like another two months. It was like ongoing, like 16, 17. I spent my 17th birthday in jail. Now I'm a first time mom. My son is four months. I'm in college, obtaining my associate's degree in business management. And I work from home doing work study. Oh my God, I love Dawn so much. Like I needed like money. I needed like transportation to get to like interviews and stuff like that. And she will always come through. Like sometimes I'll be hungry because before I wasn't on like food stamps or government assistance or nothing like that. And she helped me get the application in. She helped me get my application in for college. Shaylin Boyd, Girl Val's program coordinator, says providing such resources to the young women in the program make their community stronger overall. There's so many youth that need that guidance, that need that help. And without our resources at Girl Val, I don't know where they would be. And they tell us that every day in our workshops, they're like, you know, I share your resources every day with others around me. So it's not just like we're impacting our participants, we're, com uh, we're impacting their communities. I felt like because I've been incarcerated, I'll never be able to get a job. I'll never be able to go to college. I'll never um, be able to do the things that I wanted to do. And Grova has showed me like, just because you have this little, you had this little bump in the road, doesn't mean that your life is completely over. Ro knows firsthand how to maneuver past obstacles, and it's that tenacity that inspires her work. So Dawn, tell me your story. What brought you to this kind of work? So I think my story is rather interesting. I was a high school dropout, suffering from parental abandonment. I was suicidal. Um, at some point in my life, I was a couch surfer, uh, and I really didn't have any type of direction. I grew up with three friends. Two of them are incarcerated uh, for life uh, due to murder charges. One is deceased and then there's me. 
Why did I think and how could I even think that I would have a chance at life and that I would be able to aspire to anything? It's through meeting people after I tried to commit suicide that I learned that I had, I had value. I learned that I was intellectual enough and I learned that I could do something greater with my life. There's only but so much that we can do to close the door on those relationships because those relationships are key because in some sort of way, we still have to take responsibility for our work. My goal is to leave a legacy so that young people can continue the torch and carry on the work. I want them to know that all things are possible no matter what their experiences have been. Abby Ashola for Urban U. Mary Rogers always resonated with me. I was fascinated with her in that time period, but I'm a collaborator. And so this was not an endeavor I wanted to take on myself. I think Mary Rogers and the story that we've created now with my collaborators, Tariq Kamami and Thomas Hodges is a universal story for a woman who is really trying to discover her own sense of purpose and her own identity. The world is changing, eyes are opening. There were a number of writers who were fascinated with her death and continued to write about her. I was more fascinated by who was she in her life. So what should I do? What should I do? What should I do now? So we were only about six weeks into rehearsal with an incredible BMCC cast. And we get out of rehearsal and we're told the college is shutting down. And so I was just focused as the director to say to the actors, don't worry, we'll find a way to rehearse and keep going online. We'll be back before you know it. And of course that didn't happen. When I felt like giving up, especially early on over Zoom, all it took was looking at those faces in these Zoom squares, knowing we needed to keep going. People are marching, people are fighting the good fight. We didn't know that by fall 2020, we would still be online. And over the summer, when it became clear we would not be able to be in person, I had to really think hard about whether or not it made sense to do this musical on Zoom. And so that's when I decided, let's do a good old fashioned radio play. The audience's imagination was really much more exciting to me. Welcome to the audio musical, The Life of Mary Rogers, an incredible, plausible, entirely made up true story from 1841. So the reaction to the podcast has really been positive. 
some people are familiar with Mary Rogers from the Edgar Allan Poe story, for example, but not much more than that. Uh, so the fascination has been there. I really hope that the life of Mary Rogers continues to have life. We have learned so much from working with an incredible team, an incredible cast. So stay tuned. We're not done with it yet. Still up on Urban U, an activist and queer icon who contributed immensely to the dismantling of segregation and discrimination in the U.S. Hunter College's own Pauli Murray. Stay tuned. Video games are such a weird phenomenon. They're the highest grossing form of pop culture in the entire world, but we know so little about them. So as a kid, um, we didn't have a lot of money. My family was on the lower end of the lower middle class spectrum in Bensonhurst, Irish family, um, one income, blue collar family. My father like kind of connected having a video game console with being better off. So I always grew up with video games. First it was the Nintendo and then it just never stopped. So like there are so many people that I know out there that when they got to a certain age, they got rid of all of their video games. I haven't. I was 33 years old and my wife was five months pregnant. I just felt like I was at the point in my life where I, I had to start thinking uh, long game, uh, big picture. So I just said to myself, you've been a journalist for over a decade, you haven't written a book yet. So I told the director of my program, I'm like, I'm writing a book. And he was like, okay, go write a book. So I came in my man cave in this room right here and I'm just sitting and I'm just like, what is this book going to be about? So I just started pulling games out of the shelf. And I'm like, I know who created these games. I know that there's a story behind these games that a lot of people don't know. I started sending pitches. It was like six games. And I was like, you know what? If these people get back to me, if half of them get back to me, I'll have the beginnings of a book. Within a week, all six got back to me. I guess I wrote a good pitch. My first book, The Minds Behind the Games, Interviews with Cult and Classic Video Game Developers, is an interview anthology that tells the behind-the-scenes stories of 36 cult, classic, and indie video games from Deus Ex and E.T. to NBA Jam and Doom. Since the publishing of the first book, I've gone on to publish The Minds Behind Adventure Games, The Minds Behind Sports Games, and most recently, The Minds Behind the Shooter Games. The first book uh, has a chapter in it about Night Trap. And when I was telling people that I was writing about Night Trap, they were like, why? That game sucks. And I was like, see, that's the problem. In my journalism classes, I tell them all the time, my students, good and bad does not exist. Um, we show, we don't tell. I was like, I guarantee you there's an amazing story behind Night Trap. And there was. It's my favorite chapter in the entire book. And every person that's read the first book comes back to me and they're like, you know, that was a really freaking cool story. And that's what I feel like it's my job to do. For you to, one, um, connect with your favorite games in a way that you never thought before it was possible or to look at a game that you dismissed and see it as what it, it actually is, as a piece of art. So the one takeaway is that people make these games, people give up a piece of themselves to make these games and they deserve to be celebrated. I'd really like for the people that make these games to be more front and center. Ask the average person if they could name 10 video game designers. I doubt if they could. You know, and I mean, that's the reason why I do this. I want these people to get credit for what they do because they're rock stars. They're rock stars. And some of them have given up so much. Video game journalism, I still think that many journalists think of it as a novelty. I still think it's looked at as kind of like kid stuff, but um, that's going to change. So it's like, I knew like when, when this first book came out, I knew that it was going to get read. But I also knew that like 25 years from now, it was gonna mean a lot more. I'm creating a legacy by preserving the legacy of these amazing video game developers. So it's like, it's win-win for everyone that's involved. Hi, my name is Rudy Scala, and I'm a second year graduate student in mental health counseling at Baruch College. 
And having been a city kid all my life, I knew that Baruch encapsulated all the positives of what it meant to be to be a New Yorker. I'm married to my husband for 10 years and we live in Washington Heights with my cat Tonks. I've always had a passion for both the arts and for helping other individuals. And after 15 years of working in theater throughout New York City, I decided that it was time for a career change so that I may pursue this calling of helping individuals. And I knew that Baruch was the place for me to make this transition. After many years of being outside of the classroom, Baruch was the perfect welcoming place for me to come back, learn, and be a student again. All right, stop me if you've heard this one. A lawyer, a priest, and a poet walk into a bar. It would be the start of a bad joke if it wasn't all actually one real person. Pauli Murray lived a life intersecting with so many careers, identities, and moments in history that it would almost seem more suited for a Forrest Gump work of fiction than for real life. Because the list doesn't even end there. A friend to Langston Hughes and Eleanor Roosevelt, a civil rights activist, a women's rights activist, and a posthumous queer icon, Pauli Murray's fingerprints are everywhere across 20th century American history. But if you've never heard of her, you're not alone. She was born in 1910 as Anne Pauline Murray to a family of Black, White, and American Indian ancestry. And while we use the word she here, had the language existed then, Murray may have identified as transgender at the time. She noted herself as one of nature's experiments, a girl who should have been a boy. Some historians cite this as a reason why Murray's achievements may have been less publicly celebrated, until recently. But for however much stock she put into defining her race, gender, or orientation, or however much historians do now, one label is clear. Pauli Murray was a fighter. When Columbia didn't let her in because she was a woman, she'd graduate from Hunter College instead. When the University of North Carolina didn't let her in because she was black, she'd graduate from Howard University's law school instead, as the only woman in her class, and as valedictorian. When told to move to the back of the bus, she'd be arrested for refusing instead, a full 15 years before Rosa Parks. Indeed, it was in these realms, women's rights and civil rights, she would carve out her greatest notoriety. Her brilliant legal arguments set the foundation for Ruth Bader Ginsburg's 1971 landmark court victory against sex discrimination, and also for victory in desegregating schools in Brown versus the Board of Education, with Thurgood Marshall calling her book on race law the Bible for civil rights lawyers. Furthermore, Murray would also coin the phrase Jane Crow Law to draw a parallel between the racial discrimination of Jim Crow laws and gender discrimination. She would go on, fittingly, to serve on JFK's Presidential Commission on the Status of Women, and also help feminist icon Betty Friedan found the National Organization for Women. And just when her life seemed to have settled down, pushing 70, she decided to upend expectations one last time, of course becoming the first black woman Episcopal priest in 1977. Suffice to say, by the time of her death in 1985, Murray had left her legacy on a host of movements. She once wrote, since as a human being, I cannot allow myself to be fragmented into a Negro at one time, a woman at another, or a worker at another, I must find a unifying principle in all these movements to which I can adhere. This, it seems to me, is not only good politics, but maybe the price of survival. A legacy full of firsts and full of trailblazing, and well-deserving of her overdue recognition. For the record, I'm Ari Gold. <laughs> We leave you now with Queens College alum Jimin Yang, one of this year's resident artists with the CUNY Dance Initiative. 
Here's a peek into his film about being a queer Chinese dance artist, a highly personal account that conveys the dualities he's experiencing as the only son in an immigrant family. And thank you for watching these stories from the nation's largest urban university, the City University of New York. I love my Chinese community, but they made me feel so guilty for being myself. I love my artistic community, but they do not understand the Chinese parts of me that I hold dear. I love dance, but it does not bring me bread and butter. I know my parents are right about that. Life as a working artist is not part of the traditional path. <laughs>